If you haven't heard of the Mega Avalanche, then it's a pretty crazy race that starts atop a glacier in the French Alps before racing 2,600 metres right down to the valley floor. Another interesting thing about the Mega Avalanche and why it makes it such a tricky race is the fact it starts on snow. Now glaciers are pretty hard to ride as they are, but imagine doing it alongside 2,000 other people. So I had the idea to go and race the Mega Avalanche and because it was on my list of things to do, I needed someone to come and show me how to do it. Ed, good lad that he is, has done it before and I thought maybe I'd be able to learn a thing or two from his experiences. The Mega is definitely one of the hardest races you could ever contemplate doing. So the starting point was going to be the bike. I decided to go for my long-term nuke-proof Mega 275 behind us here for the race. Not being at the extreme end of things, the long-term bike definitely isn't going to revolutionise anything. But it's got a slack head angle, a long wheelbase, 160mm of travel and can definitely take a beating. My long-termer is the 650B version of the Mega bike. Ed chose the 29er for the race. Now what I was thinking was that I would pick exactly the same bike but in the 29 inch wheeled option. So the spec of the bikes is pretty much the same. We both got running the same forks, both running the same shock. Tyres were different but that's just down to personal preference. So really what we were comparing is were the big wheels faster than the small wheels but also we we're comparing whether Alex, who's never done the race before, can do just as well as me who's got the experience or is it really just down to luck of the draw? So the Mega Avalanche is a mass start race. There's a qualification round with 10 waves of 150 riders and they all race down one single track for a place in the main race on Sunday. Top 35 from each qualification round make it to the Sunday's race and depending on where you finish in your qualification round decides how far towards the front you start during the main race on Sunday. This is pretty important because the snow is being so hard to ride and it gets so rutted so quickly. If you're going to do well in the main race, you really need to be in those first two rows to get a clean start and get clear of the pack. So with all that in mind, first you have to qualify. I was lucky, in the qualification rounds, I was on the front row of riders and I had my race head on. Got my elbows out, got really angry and went for it. Had one crash, but still managed a respectable fifth place finish. I think I finished fourth. Fourth, you yeah, fourth. Still managed a respectable fourth place finish, which wasn't too bad. That put me on the second row for the final event. So Al and I were in the same qualifier, and off the start I was probably a bit too polite to all the riders around <laughs> me, and lost a few valuable places into the first turn. Over the next bit, over the rocks and through the snow, I managed to gain some places back. So it was all going pretty well, I was sitting in the top ten, and then I was just dropped into the last tarmac sprint to the finish and I was absolutely knackered, so I was just leaning on the bars, just trying to keep the pedals turning. But then someone came up beside me and tried to overtake where there was no space. So I ended up locking bars and then both crashed and slid along the tarmac. Oh. He jumped up and got away pretty quick, but I was there pretty winded <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> ah. <sighs> oh, I sat on the floor for a good 15 minutes before one of the guys from the chalet we were staying with came over and shouted at me to get back on my bike. At this point I pulled myself together and nursed it through the finish line. I'd lost quite a lot of places but I still managed to scrape into Sunday's race. Battered and bruised but still together. With qualifying out of the way, I had a couple of days to chill out and compose myself. After a really, really restless night's sleep, I woke up on Sunday morning not especially ready for the race. But you had to do it. So with bleary eyes, climbing into the gondola with 50 other people going to the top of the mountain, you kind of have your own little compartment, your own little world that you can sink into and kind of concentrate on what, what you had to do, the job at hand. You get to the top really, really early. It's bloody cold, the wind's blowing, you're at 3,300 meters and it's just overwhelming. It's an overwhelming feeling of, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm completely out of my depth. Hey man, is, is it on? Yes. And it's... Um, it's a pretty tense atmosphere, isn't it? Yeah, it's really tense. Yeah, the like, music's going, everyone's lining up with their bikes, kind of doing their warm-ups. There's a massive queue for the toilet, everyone's got pre-race nerves. And then as towards the race, the helicopter flies over and yeah. all the riders are lined up and then the music gets louder and then you kind of, yeah, getting in the moment. It's like you're getting pumped up, you're getting amped, the tape lifts and you're just like, whoa, <laughs> like what's happened? React, react, react. 
and you have to set off down this mountain, down the glacier, and it's, it's carnage, it's yeah, absolute carnage. All the plans you had kind of go out the window, you might see a line that you're going to go to, yeah. and then suddenly there's five people have fallen over in that rut, or the rut has shifted around in the snow. So you've just got to make it up as you go along, really. It's not easy. So as I qualified quite far back in the pack due to the crash, I was about 10 rows behind Al. So when the tape dropped and I could see the riders ahead going down the snow, I was just kind of hoping that Al was out in that pack. I was trying to ride, but it, to be honest, it was just really sore from the crash I'd had earlier in the week. But as I say, I was hoping that Al had got out in that first pack and that he was, he was well down the course by then. I tried my hardest, promise. I really did genuinely try my hardest. There's no footage of me walking next to my bike. There is, there isn't, there might be. <laughs> <laughs> so I set off and it was, like I said, just carnage. Um, in the snow, the ruts were deep, there were people everywhere. I did actually find myself walking next to my bike at one point, wondering what on earth was going on. There were moments where I was riding, there were moments where I was running. It was a sensory overload, it was just unbelievable. I managed to finish the snow probably in the Top 80-ish. The same as a qualifier, isn't it? If you if you don't get those places on the snow, yeah. then you just you're just stuck on the single track, and you've just got to take every off overtaking opportunity you've got. You do, and you ride some pretty wild lines, stuff yeah. you'd not normally ride, wouldn't you? Or practiced, or yeah. planned to practice, or even planned to ride. To be quite honest, how do you feel about the bike? Do you think it was the right decision? Yeah, I think that the Mega, my Mega was the right decision. I was used to it. I knew what was going to happen. I'd made some key setup changes to the bike just to kind of help with the extreme nature of the track. Um, I pumped the forks up, pumped them right up to 97 PSI with two tokens, pretty hard. And I put downhill tyres and tubes on the bike, kind of both tyres around 30 PSI to avoid getting punctures. This proved to be key when you're absolutely hanging, sitting down on the bike with your elbows down like that, <laughs> just sandbagging along waiting for anything to happen. Um, so yeah, the, the bike was good. What about your 29er, mate? Uh, I thought the 29er was a good choice because it's got the big wheels so it rolls fast. Uh, and it also helps you conserve energy because it rolls over the terrain quick and you can carry speed. So probably what you lose out in the handling um, around the tighter corners you can make up because it's climbing faster and generally you can just conserve more energy so you can ride more consistently. Oh yeah. What you don't actually realise about the Mega is how much climbing there is, and that's quite a key part of the race really. You do need a bike that can go uphill quite well. Out on the single track traverse, there's lots of little punchy climbs out of corners, and then throughout the way before you drop across down through the meadow, there's actually quite a chunky climb, and you can lose quite a few places on there if you haven't got a right bike for it. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. I can As we that. found out. <laughs> <laughs> By racing very fit Europeans. Yeah, there's a lot of pedalling, so you know it's it's not a downhill race. It, it is more of a an endurance cross-country trail race. I don't know if that exists. It's a lot of different genres, but you do have to be incredibly fit. With the 29er, I probably felt I did have a bit of an advantage over Al on the pedalling, but maybe lost out on some of the tighter switchbacks lower down the course. Where with a combination of the long bike and the tiredness, I was probably finding it a little bit hard to manoeuvre around. So I'd agree with Ed on that. The 29 is definitely better on the climbs. Um, I was absolutely hanging going into all the technical sections, but the smaller wheel sizes definitely gave me an advantage where things got a little bit tight and a bit trickier. That's how your race went then. How, where do you finish? I managed somehow to finish 67th, which is all right for a nine to fiver, I reckon. Yeah, pretty happy with it. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. What about you, Ed? What happened in the um, end? I didn't finish. Oh. I had to pull out an Alpe d'Huez, which I was pretty gutted about really. Having done the whole week and been there and I just knew that the feeling at the bottom when you finish it and I was just, all the other riders were down there. They got the elation of having finished this big challenge and everyone's chatting about the race and all their stories and I'm just sat in the flat on my own feeling a bit disappointed with myself. <laughs> Would you change anything again if you did it next year? Um, to be honest with you, I I'd probably try a 29er and I'd maybe look to go for a slightly lighter bike. If I was going to do it again, I think I'd like a bit more time on the bike to get the feel for it a bit more, know, the, know where it's going to break traction uh, and how it's going to handle and then it would probably help me ride a little bit better. Maybe not crash. Looking back at my Ed's experience, it becomes clear that you can prepare as little or as much as you want. 
but it all comes down to the variables in the race, of which there are so many and so many things you can't control. You can negate some of them by choosing the right bike. As we found out, we'd probably both choose a 29er now going forward. But Ed's experience didn't really put him in better stead than me to do well at the race. There's too many variables, too many different things going on. That said, it is one amazing race and definitely should be on everyone's mountain bike bucket list.